Ah, hello on this lovely evening, lovely summer's evening in the UK. Well, it is summer's evening in, well, spring evening, really, in the Midlands. Um, so welcome. Uh, we see we've got 92 participants. Fantastic. OK, so I, I, I'm Sam Wayne. I'm the chair of the IET Northwest Midlands branch. So I'd just like to point out a few items before we get started. Um, so you can always use the chat function to have a chat amongst yourselves, to share things amongst yourselves, etc. or with, uh, with our, ourselves. I will be checking the chat all of the time. If you've got particular questions, though, please ask them in the Q&A section. So the Q&A button, if you move your mouse, wiggle your mouse a bit, you'll see the Q&A. So please put your questions in there, and then I will read out a selection of them uh, towards the end for Richard. Um, what else? Okay, so the I'd just like to advertise a couple of things that we have. Um, we have a survey going around, so I will be putting the link to the survey in the chat box. So this is to help the IET understand more about what you would like uh, for events and how you would like to see the IET to, to be run. So please follow that link. There is also quite a few links here. We have our YouTube channel. So this will be recorded and played onto YouTube as all of our past our events are. You can see our Facebook. Um, we have LinkedIn as well. Oh, and CPD certificates are available on our IET Northwest Midlands site as well. You will need to be logged in to access that, uh, but to register, it's free. You don't have to be a member of the IET. You just have to reg register yourself onto that website. So you can then download uh, the CPD certificate from there, from the files section, fill in your own name and print it out for your portfolio. Um, so let me just, before I introduce Richard, just like to point out, we do have a lot of events. You can download the events list from the well, from our website. And I will play, uh, post a link in the chat box to that. Um, and I will just tell you about our next event. So this next event is at the end of April, which is Robots to Automate Farming. And if you download our whole events list, you'll see that this is the start of a running theme of robotics in agriculture. Okay, so enough of that. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so Richard can get himself set up. And I would like to introduce Richard Green, who's very kindly um, come in to uh, give this talk. And he has done, it's not the first talk he's given, he's given quite a lot of very interesting historical talks, uh, mostly which are involved of this local area. For example, this, this West Midlands area and mostly involving the Industrial Revolution. Now, Richard's talk would originally be um, billed as a daytime or retired members talk, but uh, in the current circumstances, we're having all of our talks starting at 6 p.m. So Richard is a, an active member of our committee. Um, works very hard with us uh, putting on different events and uh, is, well, Richard, I don't know your full CV, but I know you were a lecturer and um, you've put on a lot of events involving that further education and, uh, and things like that. So, you, you know, I'll leave it over to you, Richard, to introduce all the technical details about yourself, or you might just want to launch straight in. So I'm going to be in the background and I will be checking the chat box. I'll put some links for the survey, et cetera, there, and uh, look forward to hearing from your questions, et cetera. So Richard, over to you. We've got over a hundred people watching. Uh, we're recording this, and this will be on YouTube eventually. It usually takes about a week or two. And uh, you're on mute at the moment, Richard, just as a reminder. And then I will mute myself in a minute and put my camera off as well. Everything's changed position on the screen. They do that, yeah. Yes. Richard, thank you for talking on this, uh, yeah. on this evening. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, what have I done wrong? Um, 
It's uh, it's on the bottom, isn't it? You've got your PowerPoint at the bottom there. Maybe oh, yes. I'm yeah. pressing the wrong button. There we go. Yeah. 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 Right. OK. Stick. Thanks, Richard. That all looks great. OK. I'll start. Yep. All uh, good. Right. Just to fill the background in a bit on, on this presentation, I, I volunteered to do this one at short notice because the one that we planned in January um, about women in the RAF, which um, the friend of mine that was going to deliver it, she's um, had a traumatic uh, few months due to COVID. So she was not in a, in, a, in a good place to give a presentation. So I hurriedly put this one back into some sort of condition uh, and put it in its place. So this was one I did originally for the IET and the Litchfield Waterworks Trust and uh, Litchfield, um, i trying to think who it was now, it wasn't Litchfield Live, but it was one of the Litchfield groups that I did it for. So just to sort of give you the background to the area, Litchfield, if, this is basically for people that do not know the area. So we've got Litchfield and the black country towns, Dudley, and we've got the, the Sedgley and Wombong, right the way down to Warley and Hales Lane and across West Bromwich, Warsaw. So all this is the black country area. And that's uh, the, originally, it also included Hansworth. Um, but that sort, because that was part of Staffordshire, uh, and uh, of course, we had the history of Hansworth with um, Matthew Bolton and James Watts. So basically, um, as though Litchfield wasn't part of the backcountry, it is really central to, to what went on. Um, Litchfield name, de name derives from the, from the Saxon word lice, um, which I believe means lake or marsh. Uh, you can then associate the word lich with lake, marsh or black. Um, it has also been um, associated with death as well, the field of the dead, the, the dead field. Well, if you think of a marsh, it's black, dark, that's where it comes from. But there was a story, a legend, that the Romans slaughtered a thousand Christians in Lichfield. Um, but when I was reading the uh, Stephen Shaw's book about Staffordshire, there was, he, he actually poo-pooed the story. He said there's no evidence at all that that's where it got its name from. And it never was never mentioned in Robert Plott's book. And Robert Plott wrote his book in 1688 and um, Stebbins was um, 1798. So, that's, uh, so Litchfield is, is always been known for having water. It lies in a basin, so basically it's, there's hills all the way around Litchfield. And Litchfield was first um, noted because St. Chad recognised the value of the water and set up a cell in Litchfield, hence why we've got, the, I think it's St. Mary's and St. Chad's Cathedral and St. Chad's Church. And St. Chad's Church is where uh, St. Chad had his uh, cell and where the well is, and I think the well is still has pilgrims going to it today. So I thought that's just give a bit of the background to, to Litchfield. Now Litchfield has always been associated with fresh water. Uh, and this particular um, supply of water was called the Moses Con Conduit. Uh, and this, this um, so, hang on, I've lost myself. Um, so Litchfield was unusual in that it had its own conduit long before Franciscan Friary had one, which was granted in 1301. So the Friary in Litchfield didn't have a water supply, um, but the public did. Uh, Litchfield's conduit street appears to be, uh, appears in the documents of the early 13th century and the conduit in the high street of Litchfield is referred to as a great in the Great White Register of the Cathedral around 1280. It is suggested that a cistern or well stood at the junction of Tamworth Street and Conduit Street, where the source of the water supply came 
from is purely guesswork. The close had its own private water, su uh, water supply via a conduit, which was still in use in, in 1946. Um, Pennant, during his journey to, from Chester to London, describes a tomb and gives the following story. He says, I find a Sir Humphrey Stanley of Pipe, who died in the reign of Henry VII, who had a squabble with the chapter about the conveying of water through his lands to the cl close. This might be the gentleman who incurred the censure of the church for his impiety from Stebbinshaw's History and Antiquities of Staffordshire. As the water pipes go, this one had a Richard, you've got a bit quiet there. I don't know if your mic slipped or something. I am sorry because I'm looking down. No, you have gone very quiet. Oh. Yeah, that's probably Just uh, is there a is there a piece of paper covering your microphone or something? It's on my camera. Ah, right. Okay. It's, it's it's okay it's just gone it suddenly went a bit quiet so i don't know if it's your volume control or something like that um yeah there's there's one in the windows bit at the usually at the bottom right hand corner where your volume you know that where you can click on it looks like a speaker yeah so a few others, it's not just me then. <laughs> Am I loud enough at the moment? Yeah, it's just gone a bit, it's just gone quiet. I mean, it might be that you want to, you could switch off your camera and just use the microphone and have it really close to you. I'm saying switch off your camera because we'll probably just have a close up of the of your neck. Hmm, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a few people have said they can't hear now. Very quiet. Oh, yeah, something's happening. Is it better now? Much better, yeah. I think it was probably just a loose connection, Richard. Yeah, oh, good. Right, I've gone and <laughs> jumped ahead of myself with the slides, so I'm just going... Ah, yeah, yeah. Your, your camera's still off, by the way, so it's up yeah, to you that's, anyway. That's fine, you don't want to be looking up. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's all right. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, where am I? Yeah. So, um, so Humphrey Stanley um, had a row with um, the church. Um, so, so this conduit, this particular conduit had quite an eventful life. Although the conduit itself was later known as Moses, it was thought to give it, the he gave the name Pipe to the whole area. So there is an area of Litchfield that's called Pipe. It was vandalised by Lady, Lord and Lady Stanley uh, until King Henry VII intervened in 1489 and told them to behave themselves. Um, apparently what had happened as well was the cathedral had threatened to um, excavate him from the church if he didn't restore the water. Uh, which he did so um and I, I think apparently they still say prayers for him in the in the cathedral in the early 16th century a washerwoman drawing water at the cathedral end was said to be scandalizing residents of the close during the civil war it was inevitably stripped of its lead by the soldiers because the cathedral was quite badly destroyed during the war during the civil war um, and it still bears the marks today. Um, when you visit the cathedral, you, it's, it's quite interesting to see how it was damaged and the effect that it's had on it permanently. Right, so on the 3rd of January, 1546, the citizens of Villagefield came into the possession of a certain lands and tenements outside the city. Uh, the revenues from this land and property had proved to be the finest single benefit 
out of many that the city has had. The Conduit Lands Trust is responsible for many amenities, including the Guild Hall, the famous grammar school, the clock tower, public baths, the art school, the market hall, the museum, and of course the excellent water supply. The primary objective of the Conduit Lands Trust was to conserve and maintain existing water supply to the citizens of Litchfield. Most towns in Britain in the Middle Ages had wells and springs within their boundaries. Some had running streams. Good clean water was in short supply and everywhere in the country. And in some areas, we considered it to be the highest, con highly contaminated today. Very few towns in the country had communal supply, which was guaranteed to be clean and safe. Yet the religious houses and monasteries and friaries could boast a conduit, which was more than ample for their needs. So these are the, the this is one of the um, cisterns in the city. It's, it's no longer there. And this is one of the headings where the water came from up the hills and was piped into the city. These still exist, but they're on private land, so they're not accessible anymore, unfortunately. Um, I think the landowner got tired of people pestering them. So just having a look at um, how Litchfield looked at that time in 1610. So we have three pieces of water there's only two today. This was Bishop's Pool, which is now the, which is now the gardens and um, the statue of Captain Smith and Edward the seventh are in these gardens. Captain Smith from the Titanic, that is. Minster Pool, which apparently was created by digging out the stone, which built the cathedral. And then we've got Stowe Pool. And this, at this point, this is Dam Street, which I'm mentioning that because there's a da the, the water is piped across, so there was a dam. And this is where the, there were tanners here, apparently, um, for the stage, during the stagecoach days. And this street here was actually called Sadler Street. It's now called Market Street today. And Samuel Johnson's house is on the corner here and Richard Green, his cousin, no relation, unfortunately, who was an MD, um, had his surgery just a little bit further up. When they changed the name from Sadler Street to Market Street, both Samuel and Richard refused to change their addresses. They just stuck to Sadler, they just stuck to Sadler Street. But that gives a bit of history of, of how the water was used in the city. And so, as I said, that's the three pools. A little bit more about water. In 1688, Robert's plot described how the churchyard at St Michael's was covered with several mature, several natural springs. St Michael's is at the top of a hill, so this is what he couldn't get his head around. This fact intrigued him as the church is on such high ground at the top of Green Hill. He related the following. In 1682, there was a leaded coffin, leaden coffin of one of the honorable families of Gessington of Fisherwick, laid in the vault of St. Michael's Church at Litchfield, which I noted before coffins frequently, flo frequently floated that it swam in nine inches of water that one might thrust to and fro with a common walking stick, which he told me to was, to, was actually done by the judicious gent, Mr. Swinfin, of, Mr. Swinfin of Swinfin. So there was water predominantly at the top of St. Michael's Hill. Um, Robert Plot couldn't quite get his head around this, being a bit, uh, uh, being you know, we're looking at 18, 1688. And in his book, he came up to the conclusion that the North Sea and the Irish Sea must be at different heights, and therefore this is what caused the um, the difference in water level. I've always found that theory quite intriguing. Now, 
Dr. Floyer is not um, not that well known as a physician. He was a physician of Litchfield and a great friend of Samuel Johnson's. And he had, he recognized the value of water. Um, he, he was practicing medicine in the city of Lich, Litchfield. And, you, and not surprisingly, water treatments featured a great deal in his medical practice. So John Floyd traveled around the country visiting springs and wells and documented how the local Staffordshire peasantry used certain springs. He stated, the residents of Litchfield go into the waters in their shirts and when they come out, they dress themselves in their wet linen, which they wear all day. Much commended that for their closing of the pores and keeping themselves cool. They did not commonly receive any injury or catch any cold thereby. I'm fully convinced from the experiments I have, I have seen made of it. So he recognised the value of the water. He actually set up the um, first baths in Litchfield. And this is, um, that's a picture of him. And this is St Chad's Church at, and, at Stowe. And that's Stowe Pool. Now, um, by this, by this is 1730, by this time, Bishop's Pool on the west side of the causeway had silted up completely and was a swamp crossed by gutters, cuts and ditches. Only Minster Pool retained its form as a sheet of water and it became known as the Mogs, as the Swan Mogs, sorry. Much of the same had happened, had happened in Tisto Pool, which had dwindled from 22 acres to a seven acre by St. Chad's Church. So this, this again shows the St. Chad's Church, this shows the cathedral, and again, so that's Stowe Pool, and this is Bishop's Pool, and they're actually fishing on it. So it do, does show that it was, it was at, that, at one time good water. So Minster Pool was the only part of the three pools that remain intact and, and clean. So this next one um, shows the, the relationship of it. So this diagram shows the water quality deteriorated over, the, over across the three pools that existed at that time. The point at Dam Street where the tanneries were and also Sadler Street, which is known as Market Street, which I've already explained. So what we've got here is we've got Stowe Pool and Bishop's Pool as they were in that time. And what I've done is I've superimposed them on a new map so people can appreciate how it actually looks today. Um, so you've got Minster Pool here and Stowe Pool. And this, of course, as I said earlier, is the Remembrance Gardens now, and not the Remembrance Gardens, it's the gardens. Uh, and the Remembrance Gardens are just here at the side of the, uh, side of the pool on the close. So that's how, how the uh, water supply started to foul up. And in 1773, it reached the pinnacle, basically. In, in the, the Minster Pool was extensively cleaned out and laid out in the form of a serpentine with money obtained by public subscription instigated by Anna Seward, who was the daughter of the then Bishop of Lichfield, and she lived in, in, on the Cathedral Close. From this date onwards, efforts were made to keep the pools clean, but within a hundred years they had started to fall back into the form of the mobs. In 1840, the cost of trying to keep the pools clean and as uh, amenity to the, to the city of Litchfield had risen to more than 600 pound a time. And as the close was still using Minster Pool as a, as a main sewer, this was still taking place through by this time, uh, the city of Litchfield, uh, the city itself, had an underground sewage system that deposited its sewage into Kerbera Brook 
past Pond, Pond's Mill, which meant that the sewerage was being tipped into the local rivers, um, which would eventually find its way to the Trent, um, well away from the residents of Litchfield, which I think was normal for that period. Uh, the pools were once again posing a threat to public health. And because uh, of the state, so they got a guy called um, Dr. J.C. Rawson to, um, to conduct a survey. And he starts right at the introduction of his book, which is still in print, by the way, which was I was quite surprised to get a copy. Um, he, he introduces the book uh, stating that the three ponds should be destroyed. And the rest of the book is concerned with the justification of, of the removal of the pools on the unhealthy effects of the pools we're having on the residents of Litchfield. He, um, he used everything he could think of to come up with uh, an answer as to why the pools could be filled in. He even quoted the period of the plague, saying that certain well-off families in Litchfield who lived on the opposite side of, of Minster Pool to the um, cathedral moved into the close to avoid the plague because it was the water. Well, the plague had never had anything to do with water and certainly not in Litchfield. So as the population in Litchfield were considering the future of their three pools, there was a disaster looming in what is known today as the Black Country. The towns and villages that made up the Black Country were having a humanitarian crisis on a scale never seen before in this country, except probably for the Great Plague. The supply of uncontaminated water in the Black Country was running out. This was due to several reasons. One being industrial pollution, the second due to the size and closeness of the population and the infections, infectious waste that is produced in, in an area of high human activity. And thirdly, the damage created to the level of the water tables by coal mining in the areas. The future of the, this country's industrial growth was being undermined by the health of the very workers who were generating the wealth for the country. Cholera had a massive impact on the black country. In 1832, when hundreds of people died, the worst affected areas were Bilston, Dudley, Tipton, Briley Hill, Rowley Regis and Netherton. In September 1832, the Reverend Lee wrote, the condition of Bilston has become frightful. The pestilence is literally sweeping everything before it. Neither age nor sex nor station escaping to describe this consternation of the people is impossible. Manufactories are closed and businesses completely at standstill. So this was quite a serious situation. As a, con con uh, sorry, as a con consequence, as the towns became more populated, con uh, conditions got worse, and so people took to drinking canal water and stagnant water from pools. The, as conditions deteriorated, as the century moved on in 1848, 1849, a massive cholera epidemic struck most families in the area. The same conditions were being experienced in other parts of the country, and several bills were put before Parliament in various schemes recommending trying to improve conditions. In 1852, Samuel Holden Black put before Parliament a bill to supply water to the black country. He called it South Staffordshire's Mining District Water Company Bill. Parliament rejected the bill on the grounds that the proposed supply of water, namely a brook, which was a tributary of the river Stour, was polluted with raw sewerage. So this was not such a good idea. I forgot to keep pressing. So this was basically the situation with the black country. Then 
a civil engineer by the name of um, John Robinson McLean appeared on the scene. He was born in Belfast and educated at Glasgow University. And while he was there, he was studied natural philosophy, surveying and mining engineering. With his partner, F.C. Stillman, he founded McLean and Stillman Engineering Consultants of Great George Street, Westminster. Some of his, some of his positions were advisor to the Suez Canal for the British government extensive works for Napoleon in France, chief engineer of the Plymouth and Dover harbours, chairman of the Anglo-American Anglo Telegraph Company, chief engineer overseeing the construction of the South Staffordshire Railway, which opened in 1849. He actually owned the South Staffordshire Railway, which ran from Wichita, just north of Alrywas, off the A38, all the way down through Litchfield and through into, into um, Warsaw and Dudley. He was actually, um, I think he was actually the first president of the Institute of Civil Engineers. Um, he's been overlooked to some extent, I think, because of people like Brimley uh, took, um, sort of took a higher profile than he was. So he came on the scene. And John Robinson McLean took a 25 year lease in the South Staffordshire Railway, um, thus becoming the first person to ever be the sole owner of a railway. He was only he, he was also the owner and partner with partner Richard Croft Chartner of the Cannot Chase Colliery Company. He was also, yeah, I was right. He's also president of the Institute of Civil Engineers, 1864 to 1865. So this was a South Staffordshire Mining Coral District Water Company. Uh, from a meeting held in the Georgian Wensbury, a committee was formed. Chairman Samuel Holden Blackwell, who was a Dudley Ironmaster and mine owner, Thomas Walker of Wensbury, Joseph Hobbins of Wensbury, John Marshall of Wensbury, Thomas Rose of Bilston, Thomas Spencer of Tipton, E.B. Dimmock of Bilston, Henry Martin of Wolverhampton as consulting engineer, H. Brown secretary and Charles Gilmore Brown as solicitor. So this company was formed. In the 1851, um, John Robinson McLean had a scheme which he proposed for harnessing the springs west of Litchfield, but failed due, due to a lack of interest. In 1852, the South Staffordshire Mining and District Water Company made two applications to Parliament to supply water, but both were objected to. John Robinson McLean was engaged as a consulting engineer at the Dudley Waterworks Company and suggested a merger with South Staffordshire Mining and District Water Company. So this was the beginning of what is known as South Staff's Water. Um, people that know Litchfield will know that that's St Michael's on the top of the hill. This is not quite the position of today's city station. I think that that's Rotten Row, so it's a bit further down now, but this was the headquarters of the South Staffordshire Waterworks Company. So he built it next to his, he built his railway station and had his company all in the same place. Um, following a meeting with South Staffordshire Railway Company, John Robinson McLean asked the directors to join in in forming a waterworks company, and they were as follows. John Richard Croft Charlner was a barrister, farmer and businessman of Wall Hall. Captain Richard Diet of the 53rd Foot, also a JP. Sir Charles Foster, MP of Lysway Hall. Richard Green, banker. He's um, a, de a descendant of the Richard Green that was cousin to um, Samuel Johnson. And he was a guardian of the Litchfield Workhouse. Richard Jesson, solicitor of Warsaw. 
the founding of the South Staffordshire Water Companies, Samson Lloyd III arranged a meeting at the Georgian in Warsaw on the 11th of December, 1852. Samson Lloyd III was a member of the Lloyd Iron Manufactory in Wensbury, but also the, found, the founding was the Lloyds were the founding family of the Lloyds Bank. So there's quite a lot of interesting connections here. Uh, present at the meeting were Richard Croft Chawner, Captain Richard Diet, Richard Green, Richard Jetson, um, R. Adams, Samuel H. Blackwell, John McLean, Henry Martin, Henry Wainwright, and the following were invited to become directors of the company. Samson Lloyd III, E.B. Dimmock, S.H. Blackwell, James Solly, and Thomas Walker. So, um, Dr. Rawson had written his book, and he nearly succeeded. This is um, Minster Paul looking towards the um, the gardens. So the other side of the road is where Captain Smith statue and Edward VIII statue are. So John Robinson McLean had come up with an idea to supply water to the black country. This would be achieved by diverting the streams running into Litchfield and creating a reservoir at the Friary. This would mean that Minster and Stowe pools would, would run dry and the mills would have to close. So there were mills at the bottom of Stowe Pool at that time. Um, this, the previous idea was dropped and another suggested. Um, this was to retain the pools, clean them out and raise the water level. This would restore Stowe Pool back to its original 22 acres. It also proposed to build a new reservoir at Ponds Mill, at Borough Cup Hill, and, at, and a pipeline would be constructed between Ponds Mill to the railway line, London Northern Railway. This was um, the uh, Staffordshire railway line. Um, which John Robinson McLean owned, owned to Street Hay and along the South Staffs line to the city. The pipe would then follow St John Street to Borough Cup and from there to the reservoir at, at Borough Cup Fields. So that this, you know, this was now they're going to actually take away all the water from Litchfield. Um, so this was the proposed system. Um, this, was, this is an approximate layout of the proposed system from Stopal across Pondsfield Reservoir and then following the South Staffordshire Railway line into the city with another reservoir arriving at the pumping station at Sandfields. So we've got, find me mouse, got Minster Pool there, Stopal. This is where Ponds Mills were. So they wanted this reservoir here and then pipe it all the way across. And this, by the way, is the um, London line, London to crew line that goes through Litchfield and Stafford. Um, and then up through the South Staffordshire railway line to a, a reservoir in the city centre and then piped to the proposed new pumping station at Sandfields, which is here. And this is the route of the South Staffordshire railway. So, Whoops, let me just go back. So that goes on towards Warsaw. And this is where roughly, just trying to think where the city station would be. City station would be somewhere around here. So that was this, that was the proposed um, system that was going to be put in. Um, then there's an additional, Whoops, I pressed too many buttons. Um, this is an additional scheme that was proposed. This was to build an additional reservoir at Seedy Mill. The idea was to collect water from Bilston and Bourne Brooks to feed the reservoir. The water would then be fed by a tunnel to Stowe Pool, where it would empty near the parchments. Parchments is where um, Samuel Johnson's parents lived. Um, or well, where they had their factory. That's why it was called the parchments because they made parchments. Uh, this was going to be a great feat of engineering. A, sto a stove pool was only 10 feet 
below that of the proposed reservoir. The geological layout of the land also created difficulty as it as the proposed reservoir had to had a high ridge of land between it and Stoke Paul. Consequently, the, a tunnel, the tunnel would have to be some 80 feet below the surface. The South Staffordshire Waterworks Amendment in 1857, the Act changed the plans completely. Stoke Paul was to be enlarged for the use as a main reservoir and two streams that supplied, that's Trunkfield and Lamersby Brook, I don't think I pronounced that right, would be put un, in underground tunnels. Or another tunnel would take water out in the opposite direction towards Sandfields. The tunnel would go under Dam Street and Bird Street across Beacon Path to Townfields. From there, it would pass the Bowling Green in to the pumping station shaft at Sandfields. The idea of a reservoir at CD Mill and a tunnel to Stowe Pool were retained, retained as part of the act. So in 1857, act also caused a public outcry. Um, and the mayor had to call a public meeting and Richard Chandler had explained uh, it was undesirable to have an open area of water which was to be used for domestic water supply in the middle of a city where the people could throw their dead dogs and other unpleasant objects into the water. I, I've often laughed about that and thought it's, it's it, it paints a lovely picture of the residents of Litchfield. Um, the only other person at the meeting to agree with Richard Chalmer was Dr. J. Rawson. The citizens of Litchfield voted unanimously to keep, keep Minster Paul. And the final blow came to, to Mr. Chawner and Dr. Rawson was when the Dean and Chapter of the Cathedral an announcing that, that if the Minster Paul was to be filled in, they would not agree to the close being connected to the main, to the new sewage system. So even the cathedral got into threats in to try and stop this, um, this destruction of the pools. So the plans had to be amended to meet the citizens of Litchfield's protests. And um, this is a picture from, as it says, from the South Staff's water archives. While that's there, I'll mention that we're in a very lucky position. The whole history of um, South Staff's water is intact from the day it was founded. Uh, Minster Pool was, to, was being retained as a sheet of water and the proposed tunnels were abandoned. Instead, a 30 inch pipe from cast iron and supported on brick piers was to be laid along the bed of Minster Pool, extending under Dam Street. These pipes would carry the water from Lambsmany and Trunkfield Brooks through the Minster Museum Gardens, under Bird Street, through Minster Pool into Stowe Pool. So that was the arrangement and this drawing shows the CD Mill Reservoir and the tunnel. And this tunnel was dug by hand. And it's pretty straight, which I think goes, says a lot about the civil engineers of the 1850s and the, and the navvies. And there, there of course is Stowe Pool and Minster Pool and the pipeline goes across. And there was a final part that had to be amended. The arrangement meant that water could also flow in the opposite direction, out of Stowe Pool, under Minster Pool, and under the museum gardens. The water would then be diverted into another pipe leading to a large well shaft. From this well shaft, the water would flow into a tunnel which would lead to the pumping station built at Sandfields.
So, of course, everybody has, a sem uh, has to celebrate the start of a project, digging the first sod, as it's said, as it's usually meant, that said as. The site chosen was the reservoir field situated between Stowpool and the cathedral, which is this, which is this area, I, th I assume is this area. Lord Wall, attended by Joseph Ch uh, Josiah Ch Churchill, took up position on the platform in readiness to turn the first sod. Having lifted the sod into a wheelbarrow, it was then pushed along the platform. Lord Ward addressed the crowd as the platform gave way, depositing Lord Ward and those gathered on the platform into the ground. So basically, they dug the first sod, wheeled the barrow across the platform, and all the dignitaries stood on the platform, ended up in the hole that they just dug. Um, after the laughter had died down, Lord Ward said, there's one comfort about this, we are at the bottom of it. So the pumping station was built at Sandfields. And the pumping station was designed by Edward Adams of London and built by Messrs. Branston with Quithia of Birmingham. It was equipped with two single cylinder condensing rotary beam engines supplied by James Watton Company of Soho, Birmingham. In 1866, the third steam engine was in, installed. The engines were initially powered by five Lancashire boilers, but in the late 19th century, a further four boilers have been installed. So what we have here is the boiler house, and obviously the chimney stack, and then the engine house, and this contained the uh, James Watson Co engines. Now they had to install a further engine in 1871. So an additional sump was, was constructed and work began on extending the engine house to accommodate a Cornish beam engine by, Josiah, by Jonah and George Davis of Tipton. Although the work was planned to be completed in nine months, Messrs Davis ran into financial difficulties and were declared bankrupt in January 1873, um, with the work is still incomplete. It was eventually completed by late 1873 under the direction of William Vardy, Vardry, the company's engineer. So what we have now here is the boiler house, the stack, the, the James Watt and Co boilers, I keep going to say Bolton and Watt, but it was after Bolton and Watt. The new engine house, which contained the Josiah Davis, Jonah Davis pump, and then these buildings were put on, uh, I'm not sure when, whether it was the 1920s, for the cleaning of the water. And in front of here, we had the canal, and at the back, we had the railway track. This is a, a plan of the engine house. Unfortunately, it um, doesn't show the, the Watt & Co engines. Um, there were stories told that the James Watt and Company engines were installed at Sandfields in 1757 were from the South Devon Atmospheric Railway. Uh, a guy called um, Mr. Graham Smart, uh, having carried out a lot of research through Bolton and Watt Company records and discovered that only a small limited number of components were actually used. What happened with the South Devon Atmospheric Railway Company was, they gave the engines back to Bolton and Watt on the condition that they were to, if they used anything of those engines for anybody else, they were not to charge the people for them, they were to give them parts free. And by what I've read, all they might have used is rod, uh, cylinder rods and uh, piston rods and that type of thing, they wouldn't have used the whole engine. So what we have here is the boiler house, as it was, the area where the Bolton and Watt engines were, not Bolton and Watt, James Watt and Co engines were, the new Tipton made Cornish beam engine, and this is the 
pressure vessel, which is, was three stories high. It's quite a large piece of equipment. I think it's, yeah, it's three stories. So that's the layout of the pumping station. Now, I couldn't, nearest I could find the same as the Bolson and Watt engine was this one um, that's in the museum. And that's what the engines probably look like. And this is a plan of the Cornish beam engine designed and built by Jonah Davies. And this is the pump with the force pump feeding into the, because the shaft here is 90, I think is 95 foot deep. And that's the pressure vessel, the cylinder, and then the beam in the upper story and the winch. So this is the general layout of the pumping station. And there's these lovely arches. Um, The crank is visible this from the front part is hidden by the engine originally installed in the worst. Now this is the Bolton, the, this engine, uh, waterworks at Ashfield, now operated and preserved at the Bridger and Wormstill Shirt Hill uh, Light Railway. Uh, this particular engine was originally installed at waterworks in Ashfield, now operational and preserved in, yeah, I've said the same thing twice. Okay, so now let's we just look at now the relationship between this is the the run of the pipeline. It goes through from Litchfield to Warsaw. And what John Robinson McLean did was he laid an iron pipe all the way along the side of the railway track. They built a reservoir in Warsaw for the water. And this is a map, a map uh, showing the um, the pipeline following the railway. Of course, the railway being more or less level, it was um, extremely good for, for allowing water to run under gravity. So if we move on from that period, moving on from 1773 to today, um, South Staff's Water sold the grade two listed Sandfields pumping station to a housing developer in 2002. Um, apart from a short visit in 2012, the station had been, has been closed to the public and the electricity had been cut off and therefore no heating, lighting or security. Um, things have changed now, but this was how it was when I first did this presentation in 2015. So, the Litchfield Mercury ran this article in 2013 and basically it was written by David Moore outlining the fact that we were going to lose this pumping station. It was going to just fall down because it was being so gladly, sadly neglected. So he um, got a group of us together and we started to work hard on trying to see if we could save it. So that was a newspaper article. And he had another article in 2016, and the developer had made quite a, a landmark agreement in 2016 to hand over the keys of the pumping station to, to uh, Litchfield Workworks Trust, uh, and then agree to transfer the pumping station to the trust in the 20th of October. As far as I know, I'm not sure where we are with the terms of the lease at the moment, but that's something the trustees are working very hard on. So if you look at the set inside the pumping station, um, the pumping station, of course, you can imagine was left to the elements and um, became the home for thousands of pigeons. And it was in quite a sad state. So this is what it was like when we first got in and started to think about what could we do? And this is what it looks like now. This is where the engine driver stands in front of the beam engine. Um, so the, these are his controls. Unfortunately, we've only got this engine. The, the other engine house uh, has completely gone. It was replaced in the 1920s. So this is one of the volunteers working very arduously on cleaning the cylinder. 
So you've got the, the cylinder here, you see more or less the same position. This is looking down from above. And then we've got the valves. And these valves have been taken out, cleaned, and found to be absolutely pristine. We couldn't believe how good the condition was. And this is the, the beam. And this was after they started doing restoration work. They left areas of the metalwork untouched so that um, they could watch to see how it deteriorated. So we've got the beam. And while we move, before we move on, this wall here is the original outside wall of the James Watt and Co building. These beautiful brick archways, which were bricked up as their windows. And we've got a winch, um, which is in perfect condition. Um, and this is, again, this is the original James Watt and Co brick wall. And then we've got the main hall, so you can see where the, the sh drive shaft is down off the beam into the basement. And this was when we were checking up to see if the weights were still in there and they were trying to lift the top off the dome, the dome off the top to see if there were any weights in there because we wanted to get them out if there were. Unfortunately, there the weren't, so we didn't have to absolutely empty so they're taken all the way so we've got these beautiful beams and there are two hooks on the beams and that's all the lighting that was in this building when it was built there's no gas and obviously no electricity and um, the drivers just had to work by two oil lamps at night again this is the original James Watt James Watt and Co outside wall This is looking down into the shaft. So the 93 foot deep, I think it's 90 foot three deep shaft is here. And the entrance is just at that point. This is looking down the shaft. I took a photograph of somebody else's photo. I was not going to risk sticking my head down the shaft. This is the condenser. Um, this That's the condenser rather. And there, this is the chamber of water that the condenser stood in. It's just here as well. And the water was pumped from the canal into the chamber and then ran out back into the canal. So this this is the, uh, then they've got the force pump here. So there's a pump at the bottom of the valve at the bottom of the shaft and a valve at the top. And then it goes into the pressure vessel on the other side of the wall. This is where the James Watt & Co engines used to be. The building was knocked down and rebuilt in the 1960s. So we lost all that heritage when that was done. And um, they plastered, this is, this is the original uh, James Watt Co wall. And it was plastered over because somebody taken the uh, screed off here to see if it's still the original brickwork and it is. And we've got a working overhead crane, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and these photographs are quite old. This area has been really cleaned up in the last 12 months. And then we've got the room where the pressure vessel was. That's where the force pump water came through and the pressure vessel was here. And we've got some disused valves and then we've got a compressor house. Um, and you, this part of the walls um, of the, um, both sides are original up to this point. So these were built when the, the Watson Co pumps were put in. And then we had, before, before we got hit by COVID, um, we decided to do some carol singing inside the pumping station. So I took a few, when I realised um, with a bit of temporary lighting that we'd thrown in, how brilliant it was um, to, to illuminate it this way. I took some photographs. So you've got the underside of the beam here and here, and you can see these beautiful columns that were built and our two musicians playing for us. 
So this is the history of how we sent water from Lichfield to the Black Country during the cholera outbreak and probably we'll never know saved tens of thousands of lives by giving them fresh water. So this is Sandfields today with this 1960s building, which we can't do anything with because the building is grade two star listed, which means everything is protected. So unfortunately, as though we dislike, some of us dislike this austere, very utilitarian sort of 1960s concrete monstrosity um, it is protected so this is how it looks today the canal is gone unfortunately uh, but it's been rebuilt around the back so the Hetherick and Canal Trust are striving very hard to restore the canal now the pumping station was opened was open at one time. Uh, we open on a Friday, 10 till 12, and this is for volunteers to do cleaning. Uh, and visitors are most welcome. Um, if people want guided tours, uh, if they contact the trust or if they can know how to contact me, contact me and I'll arrange for a guided tour. Um, we prefer to work with a maximum of 10 because it makes it easier. But we will be opening on a Friday soon. That's what came from our last meeting. So just to give you um, a bibliography of what I've done, the acknowledgements. So, um, and of course, I can't, I'll take questions once the slideshow has ended. All right, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Richard. Uh, okay. thank you, and thank you everyone for attending and your comments and questions, most helpful. Apologies, there was a, a slight issue with the microphone, but that was all rectified, so you came through loud and clear, Richard, so I'm glad that we caught early on. Um, a couple of comments of, of people said that their reminder was at the wrong time, so uh, some people only join from 7 p.m. onwards. We do have a hundred people, actually, a hundred participants, by the way. So it has been wonderful. So apologies if you did get a incorrect time reminder. Um, it will be record. Well, it has been recorded and it will be shown on YouTube uh, in about a week. So I've put the link to our YouTube on the chat. There's a link to the CPD certificates in the chat. Uh, there is also a link to the uh, survey that I mentioned at the start of all of this as well. So thank you very much. And we've got, um, oh, we've got some thanks coming through as well, which is really nice to, to see. So uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, Richard. Not um, so bad, Richard. I'll, I'll click them. Yeah, I'm just letting you rest your voice as well a minute. So oh. I'm just in time for a second as well before I, I move on. And uh, no, that was wonderful. And it, and it leads really nicely into Richard's next event, which will be on the 11th of May, which is the Cornish Beam Engine, which was originally billed as a visit. Obviously it's not now, but I think you've made some arrangement to, um... yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at the chats coming through. Okay. I think the biggest problem was actually was the, the time change that we happened on Sunday. So uh, yeah. Okay, I will resubmit some links. So I'm just trying to see these as they go through. Where was I? Richard is going to follow up with a talk on the Cornish Beam engine as well on the 11th of May. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Richard, as well. Um, yeah. And I'll also just ask, um, there's a couple of questions. Um, just before you do, Richard, and talk about your, your next talk, uh, do you know why Litchfield is referred to as the moral city of Litchfield in folk history? No, I don't. That's that's a new one, unless it's to do with the fact that it's always been a, a Christian settlement. Right. Yeah. St. Chad being the first person to really settle in the area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, we've had some comments on the, the Q&A um, talking about the um, in the northeast where you can find the Ryhope Engine Museum just south of Sunderland. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's the pumping station. It was built in 1868 to supply water to the Sunderland area. Uh, mm. And it was running until 1967. I mean, that's 100 years of continuous use. Yeah. And it's one of the finest industrial monuments in the northeast of England. It's a grade two star listed building. Um, but the two 100 horsepower beam engines are still kept in working order by volunteers yeah. of the I Hope Engines Trust. So, uh, oh, in addition to the beam engines um, built by R&W Hawthorne are three Lancashire boilers of eight, six, 1908, two of which are in regular use, a blacksmith's forge, a water wheel, numerous steam engines and pumps, waterworks accessories such as depth recorders and many items. I will actually post, if Carol doesn't mind, I will just post a part of that into the chat because I think it will be useful for, um, for other people and something to put on the, uh, the, the bucket list once we're free and we can uh, do these visitations again. So I'll just drop this into the chat and uh, I will just also pop some other links to the CPD certificates, et cetera, in the chats. Because we, the history of the pumping station, of course, it was a business. And therefore, when the, they, they replaced, they replaced the James Watt engines, Watt and Co engines, and then for horizontal ones, and then those were changed for electric motors. And that's when they knocked the building down and re, reconfigured it for um, electric pumps. And the building is very poorly insulated because of the heat that was generated by the electric pumps. They didn't need to heat it. So we, that was an issue that we've got with the building is it's not well insulated. And we did have a, an event there in the winter where we all froze. But um, yeah, it's sad that we've lost the boilers and the Watt and Co engines. But that was because our staff, of course, was running a business. And that's why that's why we've lost such a loss of heritage, because it wasn't being deemed um, important. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to put the link to our Northwest Midlands site as well. So if you navigate to that link on the Northwest Midlands site, that will take you to a uh, pictures of ourselves uh, pre-lockdown. Hair, of course. <laughs> um, and you will also find a link to files. Now, under files, you'll then see the CPD certificates. So you'll find a link to that. So, and you will also find a link to where you can download our events list as well. So let me just check the uh, QA. Yep. Yeah, okay. So that's wonderful. I, uh, I think. That's it, actually. I'm just checking the, the chat. Um, as I've mentioned, we are all volunteers here. Richard's a volunteer, I'm a volunteer. Um, so we are the Northwest Midlands group. Um, but yes, we will feed back to the IET about that time issue. I, 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 I think it might have been to do with the, the sudden time change that we had and maybe the clocks didn't work properly or something. Um, yeah, okay. But we will look into that and just double check everything because we do have some uh, events coming up. We have Agricultural Robotics, which is our uh, next event. Let me just mention that. So it's Robots to Automate Farming, which is on the 29th of April. And that is a Thursday. All of our events, by the way, start at 6 p.m. Um, and this will kick off a theme of robots in farming um, talk sets of talks that we have throughout so do download the events list if you want to have a look at that uh, like i say that that's separate to richard's talk which is the cornish beam engine on the 11th of may i think i've got that date right yeah wonderful okay so i won't keep everyone uh every, any longer than i need to we're getting lots of thanks so Yes, people saying we'll make the next visit, visit to Litchfield more interesting. It's always nice to know a bit more about the background. It's such a nice town when I get the rare opportunity to city. visit. City. City. Um, What's that, sorry? Litchfield is a city. Yes, yes. Not a town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
yeah. funny as it is. Yeah, we don't want people. Uh, yeah. yeah. Get to arguments get here. Lot of the local residents from this <laughs> town. So, and thanks very much, Richard, for stepping in with this talk, which repre replaced the history of the RAF and um, and um, the uh, Lynn McIntyre thing had a, a lot of um, personal problems, so I couldn't make it. So thanks for coming in, stepping in to, to do this one. You've done some good talks, Richard. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. I think, uh, yeah, that's it for the chat and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you. Take care, bye-bye.